Hey, what up world? Welcome to Hacking the System. It's your boy Ian, and I'm here with, with my good friend Ace, Dr. Ace. Hello I'm world. Here. So today's show, we'll be talking about how to hack school, and specifically how to become a straight-A student. I'm here with the smartest guy I know. Let's get into it. Hey, what up world? It's your boy, The Made Man. Welcome to Hacking the System, the show where I teach you how to make six figures by any means necessary while you're still young. Create the lifestyle of your dreams, and hustle with greatness. All right, so thanks for joining us today. So I'm here, as I mentioned, with my good friend Ace, who also works at IBM as well. And this guy is the smartest guy I know. He has both an MD and a computer science degree. So Ace, welcome to the show. Welcome, and thanks for having me on your show. All right, so give us a quick bio on yourself. So I was born here in D.C., born and raised a native Washingtonian, and like actually in the city of D.C., not, like actually in, DC. not in the burbs. Not, not the not, burbs like not me. Not Maryland, <laughs> Virginia. So I'm like a native, like straight down in D.C., down in Northwest, that area, that Northwest corridor of D.C. Right. So I went to school. Everything uh, for me has been in D.C. So now, I actually went to the same school. high school as Dave Chappelle and Warren Buffett. That is correct. Warren Buffett was also one of the former alumni of Wilson Senior High School. So Dave Chappelle was there, Warren Buffett was there, Jim Henson was nearby, but he went to College Park. So I came from a pretty famous high school. Okay, interesting. So tell us about your high school, high school experience overall, because I, mean, I know you're a very smart guy, very bright. What was your experience like in high school? I would say very busy, because not only was I only just full on in academics, but I was involved in a whole bunch of extracurricular activities. I was on the school newspaper, I was on the quiz bowl team, the science bowl team, the programming team, Dang. the math <laughs> counts team. So uh -huh. I was trying to get all my extracurriculars ready for college. So do you think that was beneficial? I think it was because it gave you one thing, activities outside the school to focus on, and another thing, it beefed up your resume even more for college. Okay, so would you say having a good resume with lots of extracurricular activities is helpful for somebody applying to colleges? Definitely, definitely, because colleges tend to look sometimes even beyond the SAT score and the GPA. They want to look at what else are you doing beyond just the okay. academics. Are, are you falling back on any extracurricular activities? And any extracurricular activities you engage in, it's only a bonus. Alright, so what kind of grades were you getting in school? Straight A's. Straight A's? Nothing less than Nothing less, right? Nothing less. <laughs> Yeah, That's that the was guy, right? <laughs> the expectation. And that was not only an expectation my parents put on me because they're super strict Indian parents. They always want the best out of all their kids. They trained us from a very early age at nothing less than an A. Always shoot for the sky. Always shoot for the stars. Not just the sky, the stars. <laughs> the stars, okay. Yeah. So because if you miss the stars, at least you'll land on the sky. On the sky. So, okay, interesting. Yeah, so that's... That. So that was, our, uh, that was our mentality just from the very beginning. Even from elementary school now, I was like taking like reading courses, math courses, like very basic. I was like reading every day, reading and writing. My dad would make sure I would be reading books on a consistent basis. I would be writing and then he, I would bring back like book reports to him and he would check them. So, wow, so he was checking your stuff way back then. Like way that. back then, since elementary school. So that, I carried that over with me to high school. So that's why I had all those study habits ingrained in me when I entered high school, so that's why I was... Now, your parents are also professors, basis. right? Or your dad's a professor? My dad is a professor. My dad is a professor at Howard. Okay, he's, a, yeah. he's a physicist, and he's also a professor of mathematics, because he has like a double degree in mathematics Dang. and physics. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, okay. So, what kind of advice would you have for people who are currently in high school? I think in high school, I would say that definitely study, maintain a good GPA, but also be involved in your activities at school. I mean, so, so when you say study, what exactly do you mean? Like, can you give us, like, action steps, some actionable tips? Okay, so when I mean studying, I mean that when you go to class, make sure that when you come home, you go over all your lectures, all the notes that you took for that day, or if you didn't take any notes, at least prop over in a textbook, read the chapter for that day, and do all your homework. The first thing you do before you do wait, anything. Wait, 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 wait. Can you go back again? I think some, some people probably missed that. Yeah, yeah, I might have been going super fast for you guys, so let me just... <laughs> Slow it down for Slow you guys. Slow it for us. Right. Yeah. So you come home straight from school. Uh -huh. uh, if you don't have any other extracurricular activities that day, you come home straight from school and you right away start doing homework. Do your homework, open up your textbooks, open up your workbooks, start doing your homework. And then not only that, look over your notes for the day. So if you had like math class that day or science class that day, look over all the notes that you took that day in class. If you didn't take any notes in class, what you should do is open the chapter that you're covering currently in class and read that chapter. 
Entirely. Entirely. Yeah. Entirely. Not read skimming, reading it. No, read it. Read it. Actively take notes on that chapter. Take notes. So when I mean studying, I mean active studying, like reading chapters out of textbooks, not out of like workbooks or ebooks uh-huh. or uh, dummy guides or anything. No, uh-huh. like go into your textbook, read the textbook, take notes on it, and then you have notes for the next day. And then not only that, that's just day one of a new theme or a new topic that's so, starting. Okay, so class. during you that process, that so you're also reading ahead. Yes, I'm also reading ahead. So, for example, if I start a new semester, I make sure I get my books in early because once I have my books down early, I start reading that chapter. I read the first chapter right off the bat as soon as I get a book. Uh So that's why when I'm in class that first day, I've already read chapter one. Uh, Interesting, interesting. Yeah, because that's a big tip. I think most people, including myself back in school, didn't really do. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, something that I picked up on maybe when I got around 10th grade when the courses started stepping up in difficulty and complexity. I started to read ahead. Before I was doing just like probably everyone else, starting mm-hmm. uh, when the professor started. You want to start before the professor before the teaches. Professor starts. Starts. Exactly. Okay. And you want to say at least one uh, lesson or a couple lessons ahead of the guy. Really? So you actually like, when you say lessons, like chapters or like chapter sections ahead? So for math and science, chapters. So you have one full chapter ahead of the class. Exactly, exactly. And that came into handy when I was taking advanced placement courses or AP courses, especially for physics and for calculus. I would do all of that stuff. So I would do a chapter ahead. So if they were doing differentiation in class, I was already on like the interval (laughs) chapter in class on my own uh, free time. On the weekends or whatever. But weekends, what I do is uh, when we're talking about studying, I'm talking about studying during the week. But on the weekends, try to tone it down. And at least keep one day just where you don't have anything to study or any homework one day to do. Yourself. One day to relax, uh, detox online. and just uh-huh. relax. Because you don't want to burn yourself out too. High school is a marathon, not a sprint. Right. Wait, so if you're studying, if, so if you come back from school, you study the textbook, take notes on that chapter. Where do you find time to go a chapter ahead? So the thing is to start early. So start when you early, uh, start yeah. earlier in the semester, you get your books early and just start right away. Because yeah, we kind of have that. Okay, interesting. So it's kind of kind of like your preseason. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> like my preseason, my pre-gaming, whatever you want to call yeah. it. You just get ready before the semester even starts. So you're putting in your reps in before the actual season starts. Well, I think for everybody out there at home, definitely take notes on that. That's a big tip right there. Right yeah. Because right? I've been trying to tell my younger brother the same thing. He's currently in high school. Right. And I'm trying, trying to tell him you have to be a full chapter ahead. Exactly. So I'm full trying chapter to ahead. ingrain that in him. Second tip is don't go for the PDFs. Don't go for electronic versions of books. Go get the textbook. I know the textbook is a little more. Borrow the textbook. Go to your library and get a textbook. Uh-huh. A lot of libraries these days carry the textbook. And libraries these days are not just for going and browsing the internet and email. <laughs> they actually still have books. They still have books there. So you can go in there, check out a book. And they have a lot of textbooks, like right on file. Just check it out. It's a lot cheaper. You don't have to go on Amazon and buy a book. Just go yeah. ahead. But stick to textbooks because I've found that I've done all my studies just from textbooks. That's carried me through high school. To undergrad, so what exactly and is wrong with PDFs or ebooks? You can't really take notes. And the thing is, I like to sometimes take notes sometimes in the margins, not literally, or like I have a book right there. Uh-huh. You have something like... Oh, so you actually taking notes inside Taking the notes, and then you have something to carry around with you sometimes. So like you're eating lunch somewhere or whatever, you have a uh-huh. book or something, a workbook, and you're taking notes, or you have something to carry along with you. Interesting. Instead of, you're not going to lug your Lenovo laptop with you <laughs> <laughs> to lunch or whatever, to take right, notes right, and study. Right. So textbooks have been a big boon and uh, have been a big part of my success. Okay, Alright, so while you're in high school, when did you start preparing for SATs? So I started really early. I started from ninth grade. Actually. Ninth grade? Ninth okay. grade because I, I had just taken the PSAT in eighth grade. So, uh-huh. I, so <laughs> when I took the PSAT uh-huh. in eighth grade, I was like, I gotta get a leg up on the SAT because that's the next step. And right. basically, that's the first thing they look at. All colleges look at your SAT, SAT. score. Not After your GPA, end. not that, but the SAT. SAT. The SAT is like the first uh, criteria on their list. They want to look at if you break the minimum SAT score to get in. Right. So once you match that score, then the next thing is the GPA. Then after that is everything else. I call it the extracurricular. Right. Right. But it's basically SAT scores and GPA. That's it. So that's why a lot of your success in high school and a lot of your success that goes into getting into college depends on those first two points, the SAT score and the GPA. Now, I'm, for me, I find the SAT is kind of more like kind of like an IQ test because mm-hmm. there are people out there who have horrible GPAs, but they'll 
be just smart by nature, right? And it's born smart, and they'll do well in the SAT. So, for example, a friend in college, uh, Romain, uh -huh. like he he didn't really do much work at in school, right? But he was super smart. Like I, he would just come to a class, didn't take, do the lab, didn't do any homework, and just ace the test just on, on like instinct, right? Wow. Right. Some people kind of like that. I find it's kind of like an SAT is kind of like your, I guess your IQ, mm -hmm. while your GPA kind of measures your effort. Okay. Some people are kind of. They put in effort and they'll do well with a good GPA, but they may not be that smart with a high IQ. I right? agree. So. I agree with that. And not only that, I would add to that that the SAT score is basically a measure of how well you know the test. So what? Really? Yeah. yeah. So if you're good at practicing the SAT, like basically the t SAT doesn't test your knowledge of reading comprehension or writing or mathematics. No, it tests your knowledge of the test of the rules of the test, the sections of the test. So if you've done enough practice SAT uh, tests on your own, uh -huh. or if you bought like an SAT book, like a Kaplan book, and you've gone through all those tests, that those are usually the people who score the highest on the SAT. Really, so it's possible to hack the SAT. So exactly. what kind of hacking tips do you have for, to hack the SAT? I would say that learn the question types, especially for mathematics, I can say, because I got a perfect score on the math portion. Oh, nice, so I can nice. tell you that the math portion is just know the types of questions and just hammer those questions down. Even when you're doing it, like homework or whatever, you take out I mean, a little break. I mean, so when you break. say hammer, how, how often are we doing? Because, for example, with you, you began in ninth grade, right? Right. So was that like two years or three years of just SAT practice? Exactly. So it was just like every day. Every two, day? Every day for two years. Wow. I put in my reps. <laughs> I put in my reps. Wow. That's insane. <laughs> every day for two years. Every day for two years, not weekends. Just not all, weekends. All, just weekdays. So you come back. So five days a week. That's crazy. So you come back. You do your homework. Do your homework. Read a chapter ahead. Then you prepare for the SAT. Exactly. Wow, that's insane. And things got a little hectic as it moved to 11 to 12th grade. In 12th grade, I had seven courses, all seven of them were AP courses. So mm -hmm. imagine how many chapters I was reading a day. <laughs> <laughs> wow, interesting, interesting. Yeah. That's crazy. Okay, so once you've done the SAT, what tips do you have in terms of applying for colleges, speaking majors? So the next question you want to ask yourself is, do you want to stay close to home or do you want to go outside of uh -huh. uh, your area, your region of the country? So for me, I wanted to stay kind of close by to home, yeah. and plus my parents are, my dad, especially as a professor here at Howard, so it was convenient too, I have access to his domain. Right, so right. Because sometimes I came a lot to him for like, if I needed some advice on like mathematics or physics, but I did all of that stuff I studied on my own. Right. But even then I would come back to him and say, hey, there's an interesting problem I'm dealing with. So for that type of stuff, it's important for me to at least stay close to home. Now some people might be, more a little bit more adventurous and want to go up north to Harvard or go out west <laughs> right, to Caltech right. to Stanford if they want to seek more prestigious universities and that's fine they can do that as well so you want to get that in your mind at, yeah. from a very early point maybe I mean, around so were, those school, were those schools you kind of looked at or were weighing when you were applying for colleges or? no I don't think I had any of those schools in my list yeah. I had uh, basically just a local area schools because I wanted to stay in the area I wanted to stay, local. I wanted yeah. to stay in the area and another thing is I wanted a full ride I wanted the scholarship to get in yeah. because I didn't want to deal with debt <laughs> debt so many years down the right, line, right. paying off that debt. Coming from somebody who just paid off 60 grand in loans, <laughs> I can totally understand. Exactly, right? exactly. So for those who don't know, Asad and I actually went to the undergrad together. Exactly. Both right. of us went to GW, the George Washington University here in DC, mm -hmm. right? So, so tell us about your experience in college. So the first thing was the the real eye-opening experience was that I got the scholarship to go to GW. Right, right. So I was actually initially thinking of going to Maryland to study engineering. I was going to do maybe electrical engineering or computer engineering, not even biomed. Uh -huh. I was because they didn't really have a biomed engineering program at the time at, G, uh, at uh, UMD. UMD, okay. UMD, but they had like biological engineering, not the same thing, not something I wanted to pursue. So I was uh -huh. thinking if I get into Maryland, I'll do electrical engineering or computer engineering. Because even at that point, I was thinking medicine. But I was thinking, here in the States, you got to study something before you go into medicine. Right. Elsewhere out in the West, you have to go, you can go directly into medicine straight from high school. You have to take like a qualifying exam. If you score high enough, you go right into med school. When so you, you say go, West, do you, do you mean West Coast or, or I mean, Western world? I mean East. Well, so you go in Eastern Hemisphere, like India, China, even like Europe, Europe countries okay. in Europe. You can jump right into med school as a 17, 18 year old. Okay, so you're looking at uh, College Park, right? Mm -hmm. University of uh, Maryland in College Park yeah. and GW, George Washington University. Actually, I wasn't even thinking about GW at the time, but I had heard that there was a scholarship named after the president, uh -huh. uh, President Trachtenberg at that time. So I decided to go ahead and qualify for that because that scholarship was incidentally only for high scoring, very uh, academic 
DC students oh, as a DC public school student. So I decided to go ahead and uh, sign up for the scholarship. And this was something that I had just like out of, in the back of my mind, I wasn't even expecting to get the scholarship. I was like, okay. It was something that my dad had read in the newspaper and told me to go ahead and uh -huh. sign up for it. That, those days people used to read newspapers. Newspapers, right? Of things. Exactly, this was way back when. Like so your dad helped you, so you applied for this and it was a full ride, right? Full ride, $200,000. $200,000 scholarship. $200,000 scholarship. So I went ahead and applied with it based on my SAT scores and my GPA and my extracurricular activities. I had like four or five extracurricular activities at that time. And this was at the end of 11th grade going into 12th grade. So I went ahead and applied for that scholarship. I didn't hear anything back from that. I was like, I'm probably out of the running there. They probably have someone lined up for the scholarship anyway. <laughs> so I'm not gonna right. bother, but I'm just gonna focus on finishing this year on a high note and getting into maybe College Farm. So I heard about it later on. I think my dad was like hinting that they're already awarding the scholarship to some folks, some students from the DC area. I was like, oh, that's nice. I probably didn't get it. They probably gave it to someone from one of those uh, private schools in DC, like uh -huh. Sidwell Friends or <laughs> School Without Walls, yeah, not the, Wilson. Yeah, yeah, the, the president's schools, right? The president's <laughs> schools, exactly. And then one day my computer science, my AP computer science teacher told me that, hey, Asad, we want you to go to the library together when I was downstairs to the <laughs> library. I'm like, the library? I mean, we're in class right now. We have like a test. Right. He's like, don't worry, man. Just go to the library with us. I want you to come too. I was like, okay, yeah. Are we all going as a class? He's like, yeah, let's all go. Oh, the whole class right The whole oh, class okay. right. So I was like, okay. So we went down to the library and the library was packed. And this library was always like a ghost <laughs> town. There's no one in the library except for some kids like watching stuff like YouTube or whatever. That, uh, did they even have YouTube back then? I mean, <laughs> probably in the early days, I think, yeah. Early days, in yeah. the heyday. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, we went down to the library and then what tipped me off almost immediately was I saw my parents there too at the library. I was like, oh, my parents doing? And my brothers are there too in the library. I was uh -huh. like, what are all these folks doing? And then all of a sudden, everyone like breaks out in applause. I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah. Am I getting punked here? <laughs> like I turn around and the mascot from GW, the colonial guy, was there with a big oh, check. Wow. And he was like dancing. A big, a big check? A big check. I was oh, like, wow. was publisher's yeah. clearing house or something? Whoa, man. So they just came and then there was a representative from the Trachtenberg Scholarship of a lady she came in and then she basically made the announcement in front of the whole crowd and she was like so we're wow. awarding us out a full ride to GW for a scholarship that's a little a little less than and people are like oh, okay so it's not that much then she's like a little less than 210 <laughs> and people are like whoa, whoa. 200,000 dollars whoa and then I was like a celebrity for like a couple weeks at my high school and I was like he is the guy with the that's scholarship that's the guy with the scholarship that's the guy with the scholarship so I was getting like pats on the shoulder high fives wow. Yeah, yeah. Nice nice, huh? So it was upon getting that scholarship that I was like, okay, GW is not bad. I was like, oh, I'll, GW. I'll check it out because people were asking, are you still going to go to College Park? Because you're all about going to College Park yeah. and get Terrapin for life and everything. I was like, no, man, I have full ride. I'm not going to say yeah, no to yeah, full yeah, ride. That's nice, that's nice. So GW gave you a full ride. Did College, college Park give you anything? Or? No, uh, they just gave me admission there, but admission, they, yeah. they told me that they basically will. Uh, monitor my performance of one semester yeah, and then yeah, yeah. give me some yeah, sort of scholarship. Yeah, the same thing happened with me, right? Cause yeah. I also got into GW, didn't have, get, get a full ride like you did, right? right? They only gave me the half half scholarship, right. half tuition. Yeah. But they kind of gave that to several people. But 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 the president's scholarship, though, I think that's only like, what, four people they give it to? Or? They gave it to, yeah, about like four people that year. Out of all the people who applied and got into GW, only four people got that and you were one of those. Uh, I was one of them, yeah. That's the called DC. greatness, people. That's called greatness. <laughs> Thank you. All right, yeah. So, yeah. so so you applied went to G G GW. So tell us, walk us through that first semester in college. Yeah, definitely. So I joined up at GW in 2006, and then I signed up to do biomed engineering because mm -hmm. at that time I was thinking, okay, I'm going to do something like engineering and medicine. So that's what I'm gravitating towards. I want to do a field that incorporates both of those fields because I was a real good bio student. And uh -huh. I had good grades all around in all the subjects, but it was some. Uh, it's a, it was a subject that was particularly close to me. I wanted to go into medicine. Uh, Has that always been something you wanted to be since you were a kid? I think I wanted to be an inventor. That's what an I wanted to. Okay. From a very young age, like my like idols were like Da Vinci and Thomas Edison. I uh -huh. also wanted to invent something new. I wanted to do something groundbreaking, life changing for people. Okay. So that's why I wanted to. But I don't know. It was somewhere down the line, medicine entered into that equation. So I was like, I like bio. I want to learn how the human body works. I want to cure diseases. So I was like, okay, let's do something that does medicine and engineering while keeping 
close to the innovation aspect, innovation aspect okay. inventing something new. So that's why I entered into biomed engineering. And the first year was just like all these intro to engineering courses and stuff. I, was, I met Ian, in fact, on yeah. the first day, on one of those intro to engineering courses. Yeah, yeah, so the first day, I think it was in the, in the lab, right? In the, the lab, the exactly. lab, right. In the CS lab, yeah. yeah. And the rest is history, guys. Here we are. We're in the same are. company, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, at GW, and then at the same time in biomed engineering, not only do you have to do all those engineering courses, you have to do some of those medicine, pre-med type of courses like uh, organic chemistry, uh, chem 2, and so forth, and biophysics. You have to take that, those courses. So I was able to do all of the biomed courses in three years. So okay. I had basically one year left over to do just like... Wait, wait, wait. So did any of around. the AP classes you take transfer over? Yeah, a lot of those AP classes transferred over. That's a good question. Okay. That allowed me to finish all the biomed courses in three years instead of four years. Oh, so I, I had uh, AP computer science translate over. I didn't have to take like the C++ class. So one of the courses I didn't have to uh -huh. take. I think it might have been the C class. Right, okay. uh, calculus, I didn't have to take Cal 1 or Cal 2. <laughs> Knock that out. No, not physics 1 and physics 2. Knock that out. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And I think so. Uh, technically, it was possible to graduate in three years. Exactly, it was technically possible to graduate for three years. But I had a scholarship for four years. I had to stay there for four years. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what did you do in those like last four, last one year? Did you just take lab classes or just take classes for your grad school? Or so I did a minor. So I did three minors. Three minors. minors. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did a minor in physics, in biophysics, and computer science. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, incidentally, the physics courses and the biophysics courses overlapped quite a bit. So if you're able to do all the courses for biophysics, you essentially did all the courses for physics, uh -huh. minus like physics three or atomic physics. So I was able to do that and then computer science, yeah. I, w I was already at that point where I was like building up my programming background and this would come in handy for the next step in the journey when I actually went from biomed engineering to computer science, did a master's in computer okay. science. Okay, so prior to jumping there, what are some life hacks you have for college, right? Because college is different from high school. Yeah, definitely. It's a whole different ball game, and you have less of the hand holding that you have in, right, high, school. in high school. So now the professors are not really teaching there. They're basically telling you what you need to study. They basically assign you pages and chapters to read, and they tell you to go out and study. The exam is in two weeks or in a week in some instances. So go out and do it. Uh -huh. So again, that textbook hack that I told you guys about came in handy in college, in college too because yeah. I just went out and got the textbook and then started reading right away the textbook. That helped me out in a lot, of, especially for those pre-med courses like bio, uh, physics, organic chemistry, that helped a lot, it helped a ton. Yeah. For the engineering courses, what I did was I had a brother in electrical engineering. So he had a lot of like electronics workbooks and stuff like that, yeah. a Sham series and stuff like that. So I was able to borrow some of those books from him. What borrow? He's my brother. I basically <laughs> took him and basically just worked through those workbooks and did all yeah. the circuits, electronic stuff. Uh, and yeah, just worked on that anytime I had homework to do. I did my homework in addition to doing all that stuff. I mean, so this seems like lots and lots of work. Where did you get the, the motivation to feel? to put in all, all this effort? Two things. One thing, I had a scholarship and I had to maintain a scholarship <laughs> and maintain a minimum GPA going from year to year. Because if you didn't maintain at least, I know it was above a three, it has to be like a 3.2 or something. If you didn't maintain a 3.2, that scholarship was gone. No yeah. warning. Yeah. In one semester minus a 3.2, you're without a scholarship. Wow. And uh, at a place like GW where the tuition is like 60 grand a year, I mean, yeah. that's a big hit. So, yeah. that's why, so that's a big motivation right now, uh, right there. The second motivation was a personal motivation of mine is I always shoot for the stars. I always shoot for the stars. So that's why I have to get A's. I can't get anything less than an A. Anything less than an A is failure to me. <laughs> <laughs> I like so that, that, that was something I, uh, that, uh, that was a personal pressure I put on myself. Even my parents were putting that much pressure on me. Because mm -hmm. they knew that I was dealing with a lot of hard, heavy hitting courses. So they're like, okay, even if you get like a 3.5 or above, that's good. 3.5 is a good GPA for me, no, it yeah. wasn't good. I went to hit it even harder. Yeah. So that's why I went ahead and continued the same study habits that served me well in high school, made me a valedictorian in high school, yeah. and got me the scholarship I wanted to. Nice, nice. Keep wow. up with that. That's, that's lots of deep information right that's there. That's a lot of deep information, and it sounds like a lot of work, but it's possible when you take it one day at a time. Okay, yeah, so you kind of break it down. Um, so... So you kind of mentioned that in college they don't really teach. They don't teach, right? exactly. Yeah, and I kind of experienced that as well, right? Because we had the same classes. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, right, this guy is almost 
the main reason why I graduated. <laughs> right? like, this guy kind of carried me through college because right? I was struggling in, in uh, engineering classes. Right, so me and my my other close friend Sartag, right? Right. Me and him basically became friends with this guy, and this guy would just sit there with us, show us how to solve his problems, tutor us, coach us. Right. right? And he just basically helped helped help us get through the classes. So this guy was the best wingman ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I I think I remember on certain instances where I was basically tutoring a whole class of our classmates. I was tutoring you and Sartag and then some other engineering guys walked yeah. in in the class like I was giving a lecture or something. I was like, what is this? I'm giving a lecture for free. Right, right. But yeah, but I find that if you're teaching like a certain concept, something that's difficult for you to master yourself, if you teach it to a class room uh, full of people, you tend to learn a lot more and that yeah. kind of hones your skills even more. Now, one advice I kind of have from my perspective, right, from not, from not being the smartest guy in the, in the in uh, engineering class, right? But he was pretty smart. But I mean, I was pretty more, smart. I was more kind of like street smart, more of a hustling smart, right? In a way. So for those of, so if people ask me, how do you become friends with smart people, mm -hmm. right? Like, let's say you you out there in a the class and you want help, right? Like you can't just go up to the smartest person in the class and be like, hey, let's work together, right? <laughs> right? Like it's not that easy. You have to kind of provide some kind of value. So I think with me, what I kind of did was. I was I had a kind of like a big brother, mm -hmm. uh, Syed, a, a, a friend, right? Okay, okay. And Syed was one year above me. He was uh, I was uh, I was I think we met it was sophomore year when we kind of began doing this, but I was a sophomore and he was a junior. But Syed would help me out by getting me his old books, his old class notes, his old exams, old homeworks, whatever. And I would use that to kind of practice, right? But I didn't know how to solve this stuff, so I came to Syed like, hey, I have the last year's exam. Right, and the test is coming up in a week. Do you want to work together on this? <laughs> and that's how we kind of began working together a lot, right? Because at first I, I noticed that, I think it was me or Sartek and somebody else, but like, we kind of had to win you over, right? Because right? you can't just be work, helping everybody in the class out on their homework, right? Sure, sure. We and had I of, had a lot of other courses going right, on. Right, right. So we had to kind of provide some value to you. Mm -hmm. But I think the value, we, we, well, was mainly you, the value I brought was I had this just the old exams, old notes mm -hmm. that we could use to practice for the, for the tests. Right. Right. So what other advice do you have for people out there who want to become friends with smart people like you in class? I think just be approachable. Just walk up to them. Don't be shy. Just walk up to them and then work on like a, if it's a homework assignment or a class project. Class projects are great for that because that way that's your, like your first exposure to that person who right, guys right. are working together. Yeah. Like the, Brain to brain on an assignment. Right, yeah, because I know our first time it was actually in lab. We're doing some labs. Exactly, together. lab yeah. exercises. I mean, labs are where most people like hit off friendships right there. Right, right. When right. they're like working together, trying to get this damn lab to work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's where we met too. In right, lab. Yeah. And I met a lot of our other classmates in lab as well. We worked a lot in lab. And then that's what translated over to work, studying together on tests and so forth. Okay, so were there anything, is there anything about college you didn't like in particular? I think besides the professors and how they taught, I think yeah that was a big portion I didn't like, uh, and that was a big shock to me because I was thinking that the same stuff would carry over from high school. That these guys are professors, I know they're researchers too, but uh -huh. part of their job is to teach too. But these guys weren't teaching; they were basically just like writing the first part of a problem on the board and saying, "Okay, you do the rest of this, and this will be <laughs> on the test." But they haven't really basically explained to us how to carry out this problem, so they kind of left you out in the woods somewhere uh -huh. trying to figure it out on your own so that was like one aspect of that and another thing is sometimes in, high, uh, in college especially I felt like maybe if you're not part of a lot of extracurricular activities or the outside activities you're kind of like off on your own studying on your own so kind of like in in the dark you don't know right, if you're doing right. it the right way so it was a good thing that I met people like Ian and other people in our engineering class where we were able to collaborate together on a lot of stuff yeah because with me my first Really, my first year, I struggled because mm -hmm. I was just kind of studying on my own. Right. Exactly. It wasn't until I began kind of meeting other people and studying together that I kind of began doing better. Right? Exactly. And exactly. actually, in the 40 Laws of Power, a book by uh, Robert Greene, he has mm -hmm. a concept called that it's better to, it's not good to be in isolation by yourself. Exactly. It's better to be out there in front of everybody, mm -hmm. like in the open, I mean, I mean in, in, the, in, the, in the center, mm -hmm. and hear people talking about you than to be in isolation. Exactly. Because when you're in the center, you're in touch with the communications, with the, what's being spread around. Exactly. So, so if you and know, hey, everybody in this class has the old exams, that's why they're acing it and I'm not bothering this class, <laughs> I should probably find the old exams too. <laughs> so me, I was kind of, 
I was I was out of sync with the class, right? Because right. people, because the main issue was I was a commuter, right? I was staying off campus. So I was still staying with my family, so I take the metro every single day, like about an hour, right? From from uh, Silver Spring to DC. And after a while, I'm like, oh, people who are staying on campus are kind of sharing information that I'm not privy to. Right. So exactly. the biggest You're hack kind of out of the loop. Yeah, I was, I was out of the loops. The biggest hack I had to overcome was. I had become privy to that. Mm -hmm. And what helped me was joining NSBE, which was National Society of Black Engineers. Okay. Right? So I joined NSBE, and from there, they basically had helped me with that old books, old exams. But then the president of NSBE put me in touch with somebody he knew in his class who was in, in the same major I was doing. Mm -hmm. So he int introduced me to Syed, okay. who kind of became a, my big brother, right? Oh, so that's how you met Yeah, Syed. So, so that's how I, I met Syed. And I was like, yeah, man, that same major. So he kind of told me, hey, don't take this class. Mm -hmm. This professor sucks, <laughs> right? He, he, he won't teach you anything and he'll fail you. Take this class because this professor is a better teacher. Or here, or here, why don't you wait? Don't take this class right now. Take it next semester because we'll be a better professor. Mm -hmm. So different hacks like that, he kind of helped, helped uh, navigate me and was basically my GPS going through college. Nice. That's very awesome. That's very All awesome. right, so you finished up undergrad. Mm -hmm. Then you went to, to grad school, right? Exactly. Tell us about your grad school experience. So I was initially not even planning to go to grad school. I was planning to go straight into med school because I had taken the MCAT exam maybe at the end of my third year in mm -hmm. biomed engineering. So I had also got a, an awesome score on the MCAT. So I was thinking, but even then, so for some reason, I, was in, had, I didn't have my mind made up on to going into pursuing a career in medicine. So I was like, I'm a good programmer. I've done a lot of programming work in biomed engineering. In fact, my senior design project, I basically created the software that mm -hmm. did like a, a two-dimensional model of a ventricular action potential. That got me a really high grade on the senior design project. And everything. Yeah, that sounds complicated. <laughs> it does. And it was as complicated. And, and again, it was an example of things to come later on in life where I was doing basically stuff that I had no training in and I basically learned from scratch on my own. So I'll get into a, a little bit deeper on how to master that, okay. things like that. But basically I did that. So that kind of like spurred the, made the gears work in my mind thinking that, okay, programming is a good option too. I can do maybe a year of programming because I've done all of these courses in GW. I've basically done a minor in computer science. So I already have a leg up on computer science. So that's why I went to Howard and I did a master's in computer science and I was able to complete it in one year. So that means one semester of five courses and the second semester of wait, five wait, wait, courses. Wait, wait, wait. So you got your master's in comp sci in, in one year? In one year from Howard University. Because of classes you took prior to that? Because of classes I took in GW. GW. The minor. Oh, so they transferred over like exactly. that? Exactly. The C class, the C++ class, the Java class, oh, they transferred over. Right. So they were able to, and not only that, they were able to give me a scholarship too based on my performance. So I had a scholarship so, going to Howard. So you've as been well. going to college for free, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to go to Howard, complete that in one year, and then I did a master's thesis on a cybersecurity project. So once I finished that, then by that time I was like, okay, the only way to go up is up. So let's go to med school after this. So I still had my MCAT score that I had saved up from third year of biomed engineering. So I basically used the same score again, applied to a bunch of different medical schools. But again, I went to a close to home. So that's why I stayed around at Howard and did med school over there for four years. Was that free too? So they gave me some scholarship money, some scholarship. but they don't give you the whole shebang. Yeah, the whole shebang. <laughs> yeah. So I had also had some, uh, my parents helped me out as well too. Okay, so sure. combination of scholarship money and my parents yeah. funding me as well. So did you have any student loans for med school? No, after? no, yeah. no student loans because I didn't take out any loans. My dad was like, I'm going to help you to the point where you don't have to take, take out any money. Loans. All the money you make after med school will be your own. You don't have to use it yeah. to pay off any loans. So my parents are a big boost of support. Like nice, Very. Nice. So that's why that was a plus of staying at home. All if right. I hadn't stayed at home, I'd be off in some other state. I don't know how my parents got to help me in that right, right, aspect. Right. All right, so you said you applied from med school with your MCAT from uh, one year ago. So mm -hmm. like, what was the experience like with the MCAT compared to the SAT? So it was another beast of an exam. For starters, the exam itself is tough. I mean, it's an eight to nine hour exam, or it might be even less now. They've basically changed the format. But when I took it, it was a very, very long exam. But a written portion, a biological sciences component, physical Wait, science. Wait, eight to nine hours? Yeah. And then that's kind of like on par for the types of standardized exams you have to take in med school for your licensing exams, your step one and your step two. They're like eight, nine hour exams. Wow. Yeah. 
Imagine that. That's, that's like a marathon right there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another test that's basically, it tests how much you know about the test. So it's testing yeah. you how well you know the MCAT. Okay, so how do you practice for a nine hour exam? <laughs> you don't do it in one day. You don't do it in one <laughs> week. You don't do it in a month. You do it over a period of years. So yeah. for this exam, especially the MCAT, I started studying for it. Well, I think around second year of biomed engineering, so I was doing all these engineering courses and studying really? for the MCAT. Really? So in undergrad you were practicing for the MCAT? Exactly, I was studying for the MCAT <laughs> as well. And it's basically like I didn't have a summer vacation, I was like yeah. studying <laughs> for the exam. I think I went to India like after second, uh, second year, and then after that I haven't gone to India since. And finishing up these engineering courses too, because I finished them up in three years. But that's still a lot of courses in three years that I had to finish. Right, right. In addition to all the MCAT studying I had to do. So I got that out of the way, took the MCAT, got a good score and everything, and based on that, that score came in handy when I finished the master's and I applied for med school at Howard and they looked at the score and I like, that's so good So you enough. got your master's in computer science? Yes. Bio, bio, I mean, biomedical engineering was your undergrad. Undergrad, exactly. Then you went to medical school. Yeah, I went to medical school. So, right. so you kind of this multi-dimensional doctor of Judy Comic. Exactly, right? like the ultimate bionic, doctor engineer. Bionic doctor, right? <laughs> bionic doctor. Yeah. yeah, and I think I, I was in D.C. Uh, at like an event, like a meetup event that Ian invited me out to. So I met a couple of engineers there. So I was basically going over my background as an engineer, as a doctor. So they were like, you're Indian and you're an engineer and a doctor. You're like every Indian parent's dream. <laughs> <laughs> was this the IBM meetup? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was the IBM meetup. We, it, where we always have a lot of like grad students coming yeah, in, like yeah, data yeah, science yeah, students. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to like get a job, <laughs> basically. Wow, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Alright, so, so did you go, did you finish, so you got your MD? MD. Right? What was the, that process like? So the first two years were okay because they were basically like undergrad, like high school and so forth. Basically just studying and taking tests, studying and taking tests. So no problem for me. Around the third year is when I was like, what is this man, this is completely different. When you basically had to go to the hospital all day. Uh -huh. You have to go from like seven to, sometimes if you were on your surgery rotation, seven to eight, seven to nine, or sometimes you were like on call. So you came in at seven in the morning one day and you left the next day at like eight, nine o'clock. Wow. So you're on rotation. So when, it, when it's like July or your third year, that's when it starts. And it starts early too and it ends late. Third year. So just and there's no summer working, vacation. Working in the hospital the whole Working time. in the hospital, you're rotating yeah. through different, uh, no, it's uh, clinical rotations of really? third year. Is that prior to residency? Yeah, residency is after you graduate from med school. So I went through that. I think I did internal medicine, psychiatry, pediatrics, OBGYN, surgery. Wait, so, you do all that, so you have to do all that for, to, to, to graduate the MD? Exactly. You have to do all that in your third year. Oh, Just in one year so, so for example, like, you can like receive babies? Like, you, much, like, and that's, like, that's your final exam for OBGYN. <laughs> like, you have to deliver a baby with its ugly ass placenta <laughs> to graduate from or to complete OBGYN. Wow. So I was able to deliver a baby and deliver a placenta. I was lucky to not have passed out nor have vomited in the same room. But I had to like go oh, home yeah. and take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what other tests did you have to take to get a gem deal? What, what, are, what are the like stuff in the hospital were you doing? So you have to take your normal tests. So in the first and second years, it's just like all the tests that the Howard University med school professors are preparing for you. Third year comes around, you're taking nationalized tests. So you're call, uh, taking what are called the NBMEs. So these are like national board medical examinations that you take for each rotation. So example, if you take th three months of internal medicine, at the end of the three months, you take an exam, an NBME. And this is incidentally the same exam that every other med school student is taking across the country. So it's standardized results. <laughs> and then there's no yeah. curve or anything. <laughs> what you sure get is what you get. Uh, okay. <laughs> so and that's the same thing that I followed for all these rotations. So not only was I in the hospital from morning to night, I had to come home and study too. And, wow, that's and, insane. Uh, and if there was time left over, sleep and eat. <laughs> so that was insane. And then I wasn't really a fan of those hours and I wasn't really a fan of that setup because I was more of the studious type of lifestyle. I had to study and go to class, take the exams, and then yeah, I had time working, on the weekends. Yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, so for example, you mentioned you just saw like a psychiatry was one rotation you did? Yeah, psychiatry. What kind of stuff were you doing for that? Were we like diagnosing people or like 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 Freud or something like that <laughs> so that's more psychology where, psychology where Freud was but basically what I did was I basically went out to St. Elizabeth's Hospital and I think it's in Southwest DC mm -hmm. so I went out over there and basically was there from Monday to Friday just attending to patients I would go along with a psychiatrist inside of a room psychiatrist is taking his history and I was taking my notes too as well uh -huh. 
So, I mean, so what exactly is psychiatry? How is that different from like psychology? So psychiatrists can actually prescribe you medication, and psychologists cannot prescribe you. They can kind of diagnose you more or less if you have depression or bipolar I mean, so disorder. So you're doing stuff like the, what's that book, the DSM? DSM, yes. exactly. So I was using that book. I was actually reading that book cover to cover to pass that exam, the psych. Oh, the, the actual exam? The actual so exam. So surprisingly, I've actually read the book as well. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Awesome. I mean, not just kind of, I was like, hey, because I was reading some stuff, stuff about psychology and disorders and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, maybe I have a disorder, maybe I know somebody has a disorder <laughs> or whatever, right? So I, yeah. I, I didn't really read the book, I kind of skimmed the book, right? Right. I'm right? just kind of like going through it, but I'm like, hey, interesting book, right? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. kind of told me some stuff about people in general, right? For example, like, four out of ten people are sociopaths, right? No. Oh. So that means almost anywhere you go, whether it's school or work, there's going to be a sociopath you have to interact with. I'm like, okay, interesting. Yeah, that would explain a lot of my interactions <laughs> in this year. Yeah. So yeah, so that was like just one other rotation that I had to go through in third year. And then by the time you get to fourth year, then it's all electives. So the electives are based on what residency you want to pursue after med school. So mm -hmm. I was initially thinking about doing oncology and internal medicine. So right away I would have to offer all the internal medicine electives like oncology, cardiology, GI, and so forth. So I think I picked endocrinology, oncology, cardio, and then some other like rotations. I think mm -hmm. I did a radiology rotation as well. Because radiology is very important too for any rotation in internal medicine. Well, you I, gotta I, interpret an extra. So much stuff you're doing this for. Right. This is why so. this guy is a smart dude, man. <laughs> All this and computer science together, right? Yeah. Alright, so after you finished med med medical school, what was the next step in your in your progression with career or life? What was what happened after that? So if I would have followed the uh, game plan, I would have gone to residency. I would have mm -hmm. gone to residency then did fellowship and then become an intending physician and then I would be working basically in a hospital most of the time 80% of the time and 20% of the time in the clinic outpatient. Mm -hmm. But I think it's something that was born out of something that happened even when I was applying for med school or doing the MCATs. I wasn't really interested in the clinical aspect. I wanted to go into the innovation, the technology aspect of medicine. So that's kind of made me hesitate when I was applying for residency. And ultimately, I didn't really apply for residency. I finished mm -hmm. med school and I was like, no, I don't want to do clinical medicine. I don't want to work in the hospital all day. I want to actually be out there in the field inventing treatments that then doctors are going to use to improve patient outcomes. Right, so that's why I decided to search for these types of positions in like biomedical engineering or these types of like medical innovation types of positions, medical right. technology positions. So I was like searching a, uh, for a while. So that was kind of like one of the setbacks, I would think, if we get to the section on setbacks. Uh -huh. I think that was a personal setback for me because I was uh, always at the top of my class and everything. Let's I, go there right I had now. everything, uh -huh. yeah, I had everything basically handed to me. But that was handed to me on the basis of all the hard work and, yeah, the, hard work, and yeah. the hours I put in, the reps I put in. But then for the first time, I saw all my classmates go off into residency and then they would become doctors in a couple of years. And here I was, I went through the whole process, nine years of study, and I wasn't a doctor technically. I had done all the licensing exams, but they won't consider me a doctor doctor per se because right, I haven't right. done residency. But yet I was convinced, I was confident in myself that the next step I'm about to take is going to be even better than the step that I've left behind. Mm -hmm. That I can do much better than just working in the hospital as a clinician. Right. Okay. I mean, so let's say you, how long is uh, how, how long is that path in terms of uh, being uh, like going after med school? So after med school, is how long? So let's pick internal medicine for example. Because surgery is a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. So internal medicine is three years of residency. Wow. Then mm -hmm. it's like depending on the fellowship. Like uh -huh. your specialization, if you want to do cancer research or that's heart like, that's extra medicine. Debt, yeah, yeah, you have to get into right. Extra money you have to pay. So it's you not, have to. So you get paid. So that's the job. Oh, you get paid. Okay. So you get paid. So you get paid as a resident. You like, get paid like almost minimum you? wage. So you get paid like forty-five to fifty k a year. Wow, for three years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like every year you get paid. So for three years, I think it goes up slightly. So it's for example, it's like forty-nine k one year, fifty k second year, fifty-one. Why is it so low? Year. Like, there's just so much. Supply. Yeah, I, I think that's part of the problem in healthcare. Yeah, okay. I think these guys are. Really, I mean, so that that, that many people who want to be doctors. Yeah. So, so these are people who want to be doctors, but they're working almost close to minimum wage in so many hours, and they're so doing so much good work in the hospital, but they're I mean, not being but compensated I, for it. I thought that there was a sh there was a question. There weren't that many doctors that wanted to work as doctors. I mean, yeah. like I, I thought there weren't that many people wanting to be doctors. 
No, there right, are a so. ton of people because what's happening is you're having like an oversaturation of people going into the medical field where mm -hmm. now there are not even that many residency spots. The year that I was applying for residency, there are 11,000 medical school graduates who went without a residency spot. 11,000 people. Imagine graduating from med school, you don't even have a job after that. Wow, you put in four years, you have like almost close to one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars of debt. I mean, it's thousands, thousand at that school, or what was that? Nationwide. 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 Eleven thousand people went without. So what happens? Like they go, they go elsewhere. They go abroad, or so they wait. They take like a transition year where they're doing research, and then they come back again. They and apply for residency. Or they now do like they, an MPA. I mean, so were they turned down based on their scores, or based on what? I think scores. Scores is one thing, and research. Scores and research? Scores and research, and what med school you went to. It's kind of like a, what do you say, based on the type of med school you med go school to, you, you have yeah, an yeah, easier, yeah. Yeah, uh, easier chance of getting into residency. Right, right, okay. right. So if you go into the top tier of med schools, it's easier to get like a top tier I mean, tier so residency. you apply to the hospital or you apply somewhere else? To the hospital. To the hospital. So that's why so every hospital doesn't have a residency. So, so it's basically only, a job application. It's a job application, exactly, and you go on an interview. And it's like a group interview. So if you go, oh, like, man. so I applied to some <laughs> hospitals in the Baltimore area. So I basically went over with these med school guys, and then all these guys were there. It was like a group interview. They were going around the room, introducing ourselves, and they're talking about the different programs that they had, your normal day to day schedule, and you were basically there from morning until afternoon. Wow, and that was your interview. Uh, that's that's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. All right, so. <laughs> I think that was the time where me and you kind of began talking. Again, exactly. Because you know, I know when you went to medical school, you were pretty much buried in books. Exactly. And I, didn't really hear I was basically MIA, right? <laughs> yeah, you were basically MIA for like four years almost, right? Yeah. Then I think we ended up meeting how uh, again? I think I, either I texted you or you you'd called me or something like that and kind of... I think around that time I might have switched phones or something, so you yeah, didn't have yeah, my yeah, phone number, so yeah. you sent me a message on LinkedIn. You're like, oh, hey, yeah. where's, what's your new phone? Yeah, 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 yeah. all right. So then I know from there you wanted to make a career switch. Exactly. Right. So I mean, so let's say you had gone out to be a doctor. What was like the expected income you would have like per year? I think uh, for me, I wanted to go into internal medicine. So I think right off the bat, I'd be making over a hundred k, maybe hundred fifty k. Like that's it, really? Yeah. Just that. Just that. So that's without specialization. If you specialize, they say I don't know how much of it is <laughs> factual, but they say two hundred fifty to three hundred k. For like a specialist, so a specialist meaning like an oncologist, cardiologist. I mean, so was your plan to like specialize or end. not to specialize? My plan was to specialize okay. because I knew that I would just be making like a hundred, hundred fifty k max. Right, That's right. it. If I did no specialization, if I just did general. So, uh, so what's, how do you specialize? Is that more? more so specialty? that's fellowship. So that's more. That's another job that you do. Fellowship. How long is that? So that depends. So if it's cardiology, it's three years. If it's oncology, it's three so years. So it's like six years after, yeah. Yeah. Six extra years. So yeah, five, six years after med school. Yeah. Uh, okay, interesting. Crazy. Yeah, but you're getting paid. But right, still, right, right, right. You're not getting paid like. Uh, I mean, so basically, position. like a, an average doctor who's generalized makes like 150K or so. Average. Average. Yeah. average. If you specialize, it's like, you said 250, 300? Yeah, 250 to 300. I think some cardiologists go up to 400. Okay. Okay, interesting. Yeah. But not all. Not all. It all depends. There's a lot of factors that. For sure, the hospital you're working in, uh, the amount of research you've already done, and so forth. That also plays I mean, a so role. So does the in hospital that. pay you? Because I know some people you mentioned get paid per surgery, for example. I think exactly. So those are surgeons. So, so I'm surgeons. talking solely about internal medicine, which is a non-surgical specialty. For surgery, it's a lot more years after med school, but it's a lot more pay. And then when you become like a surgeon, and you'll become specialized. Like I had a surgeon while in college who I worked alongside in med school. He's a surgeon at Howard University Hospital. This guy was coming in, doing like breast resections, taking out cancers, taking out tumors, and he was making eight thousand dollars per procedure. One day, he had six procedures and made forty-eight k, and he walked home happy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I find that to be kind of a bad model, though, right? Because mm -hmm. this is just my personal take. I guess from my family, like doctors are almost incentivized to wanna do more procedures. Mm -hmm. I know my, my younger brother, we went to John Hopkins because he had some kind of hurt, hurt uh, defect or uh, I don't know what it's called, like a murmur or whatever, I don't okay, know. A murmur. Right? And doctors wanted to opt to operate on him. Mm. My mom was like, hell no, hell no. You were not, were not doing any diagnostics, doing any labs? No, I mean, I mean like, there, there were like multiple trips they went there to John Hopkins, right? Because mm -hmm. we were back then we were in Columbia, Maryland, but okay. they referred us to John Hopkins because it's like the best or whatever, right? Sure. 
and the doctors wanted to, they were like adamant about like doing surgery mm. uh, on my young, younger brother. And he, he was like, I think like around two years old. Wow, that's and, insane. And, and they're like, the side effects of this are like, he'll be like, I don't know, like, I guess, uh, what was the term for it? Um, he basically won't be normal anymore, right? Side effects of the procedure? Yeah, yeah. Side yeah, effects yeah, of the condition? They, yeah, so side effects after they do the, the procedure, because they'll do some stuff, I don't know. What wow, happens. so there's no uh, guarantee that the procedure would even work. Right, I mean, so basically he would be worse off, right? Wow. But apparently he, he, would, he would have a chance to live. Mm. Right, so my mom, my mom was like, you know what? No, I'm not doing this. This doesn't mean right. What's the point of doing this? It's just gonna be like disabled for his whole life, mm. right? So she said no. But then we had to do like annual visits every single year. Mm -hmm. My mom was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do the whole, I guess the whole just not do anything, right? I don't trust you guys. Cause it seems you guys are just, just doing, doing this for the money, right? Fast forward like ten years later, he's still perfectly fine. No issues, nothing. Exactly. No that procedure was like, necessary. That was like, you know what? I messed up. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's I'm like, not very you know, common. Like it's not uncommon. You're playing with somebody's yeah. life here, right? And it felt, it felt like the doctor was just doing this because he was trying to get paid. Yeah. And you know, cause he was like, hey, maybe I have this debt I have with my family. Maybe I have to pay the student loans. Maybe I have to buy this new Lambo. I don't know, right? <laughs> so let me just take these people through this conveyor belt and do as many operations as I can to get paid. Yeah. I mean, so how does that work in the medical field? So exactly, and you did a perfect allusion to that. The fact that a lot of doctors are are dealing with the stress of paying off their student loans, and also they just want the money too. Like if you have a doctor who's making eight thousand dollars per procedure, yeah, per procedure, of course the incentive is there to pr uh, go for the surgery even before doing any other. Right, right. Because I mean, that's basically kind of like a. I would expect that more in something like sales, right? Because me and you both work in sales, right? Right. Exactly. Because we get paid on commission. Right. Because <laughs> sometimes you want to close a deal. And have the customer buy something. It may not, not be the best product for them. But you're like, I have bills to pay, man. <laughs> I, have, I have a family to feed. So you're thinking right away. You're putting your interests above that. Right, right, customer. right. The doctor's putting but I his feel interests like, above those of But the I feel like in sales or like software, it's kind of understandable. But when you're dealing with people's lives, yeah. it's totally different. Yeah, I know. You can't really have a cutthroat sales, almost school for Wall Street model. Mm -hmm. and something like healthcare. Yeah, right? where life and death is paramount every day. Right. So yeah. Well, anyway, uh, <laughs> getting back on topic. <laughs> All right. So that was the ideal. So after after med school, you ended up working at IBM, right? So I w ended up working at IBM in great and huge parts thanks to this guy over here. Yeah. So it's kind of ironic how that works out, right? So this guy helped me through college. Then I, IBM had a job opening, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking. I'm like. I was thinking of about, about bringing people to IBM because I basically get paid like it was like five grand per person at IBM hires that mm -hmm. I refer. That's correct. Then I was like, I was thinking of all, all these other people. I'm like, hey, I was I'm talking to you right now. You did come side, right? Because I, I still had this mind of you as a doctor, right? And we're lo lo looking for more for like engineers type, you know, looking for sales engineers, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, you actually this guy's the smartest guy I know, and so I think I was like, hey, Dino Spark or Hadoop or whatever, yeah, right? Exactly. And you're like, no, but I'll check up on it. <laughs> and I basically sent you the job listing, the job description, right? We met, I kind of walked you through the right things to say, the mm -hmm. right stuff to, I basically gave you like all the stuff we usually work on, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it was like, what, over the course of a month or so, you applied? Or? Yeah, it was, I think in February you told me about it, or maybe in March, and then I applied. That was, this was last year. Last year, last year. And then I applied to it, and then you basically got me involved in the email chain with the higher guys in command. Yeah. Up, so, up, I mean, so up. I basically, I, once I kind of coached him up, mm -hmm. I brought him in and took him straight to the director. Mm -hmm. So he basically went through, went through the, the back door, right? Exactly. He, he didn't apply on, on the website or whatever. This, no. is, this is why it helps to know people, right? Yeah. All right. This is where I bring some value too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but you know, I have some social capital, right? <laughs> So basically, I, I, I brought you into the director, and you went for an interview. It was like, what, two interviews or one interview? So I basically interviewed first with the director. He basically called me on my home phone, and I talked to him. Then I talked to one of the managers who worked underneath him in the same analytics department. Talked to him over the phone, and then that set up an in-person interview with one of the engineers on the team. So this happened off-site. I interviewed with him, 
And then that led to a demo presentation that I had to do on site in front of not just a manager, not just a director, but a couple of the engineers on the team. And then after that, I met with a sales manager directly involved with the healthcare accounts, the healthcare division under which I would be working. Yeah, so that's kind of the connection, right? So, so five interviews. You're probably saying, what, what's the guy with the MD doing working in that in sales, right? And I still get that question every time from right. family members. From but friends. the thing is, right, he, he's working in federal healthcare with IBM. Right. Right. So he having that medical knowledge helps. Yeah. It helps progress it helps large deals, right? Exactly. And the good thing I, I like about sales is, right, commission checks, right? So they, they, it gives you that, that incentive to go out there and close big deals. Mm -hmm. And also, your pay isn't really capped. Mm -hmm. Right. So exactly. can you tell us about that? I mean, so so how's the how's the pay in this new role in IBM? The pay is good. the The base that they offered me was really nice. That uh, that gave me a lot of it was six figures, right? Six oh, figure right. base pay, not not bad, especially for a person without experience coming straight in, basically for his first job and getting a six figure base pay. And then the commission check was a new concept for me because I uh, Ian had already been working there for three years, so he was already well. I mean, so in the do you mind me commission. saying how much you make, like ball figure? Just say six figures. Keep it at <laughs> He makes good money, though. Use your imagination. The, uh, the money is good. As you can see, the money is very good. <laughs> All right, interesting. All right, yeah, so, so that the commissions aspect of it makes me think that not only am I going to be dealing with the engineering part, the, designing the demos, but also designing demos that can showcase the best technologies, especially technologies that will, that will give us the commission check and ultimately will be selling the underlying technologies, not so much a solution. Uh -huh. that we okay, I mean, so in terms of going back to income, because this is a money channel, obviously, right? Go ahead. We like talking about money, right? <laughs> I know you're trying to kind of navigate around it, and, and it's understandable, sure. but I mean, so was the income you're earning this, in this show, was this kind of like a downgrade compared to being a doctor? Was it on the same level? Like, do you think you, there's, there's, there's a better chance of making more money in this role? Let's, yeah. let's put it this way. If I was in residency right now, I'd only be making 49k before taxes. <laughs> right now, the money, amount of money I make right now, uh -huh. I'm in much better shape right now than I would be as a resident physician. Working those hours here, I'm working remotely. Oh, I have my own <laughs> work week planned for me when I have meetings I come in. Otherwise, right, I'm right. working from home. And then the money is excellent. IBM pays for trips. IBM pays for travel. IBM covers me all the way. Right, right. That's yeah. interesting. And that way, I'm much better off in this role than I would have been if I stuck to the residency attending physician route. Right, right, okay. All right, so what are your long-term career goals and plans? I think I want to continue to advance and do a lot more stuff in the medical technology field. I want to also be in charge, in charge, not just making them, but in charge of making medical solutions. Mm -hmm. Medical solutions that can change patient outcomes at the hospital level, at the uh, federal agency level, and then go from there. At some point, I want to be in charge of all the decisions that go into making medical uh, software, making new innovations in medicine. So that's what I, I want to work towards. And I'm still relatively new to this field, so I'm sure what I'm saying right now is going to change from um, maybe next year. But definitely, I want to get to a role where I'm actually in charge of decisions making made and being in charge of a lot of talented people on my team where I can basically have a person who's working on this uh, portion of it, this other person doing design, this other person doing implementation, and then right. I'm just there making sure that I have the best team in the house <laughs> and we're making so not the best profit. want to be the boss. <laughs> I want to be the boss. I want to be the boss. Don't we all, right? <laughs> Which is a goal all you should strive to be, right? Be the boss of your own life. Exactly. Exactly. All right. All right. Well, uh, all right. So let's kind of sum things up. So. What's the biggest life hack you have? I mean, you've kind of gone through some li life hacks for school, but what's the biggest life hack you have? I mean, like, like in life, all of life, like give us three life tips. So the first life tip I would give you is, and it's kind of cliched and it's kind of overrated and sometimes it falls under the radar. People don't really uh, as ascribe to it too much, but it's determination. Determination means that if you have a goal set out in your mind that you're going to do this, then there should be nothing that detracts you from that goal. And chance, and especially I've seen in my experience that if I have my mind set on something, I always achieve it. And to this point right now, where I'm sitting right now, to where I came from, from high school and so forth, I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve in life because I had a goal in mind. I wanted a scholarship to get into GW, 
I, or into college. I got a scholarship. I wanted Absolutely. to get into med school. Yeah. I got into med school. I wanted to get a really high paying job in my in this area close to home and be able to travel, do work and do and come up with in, in, interesting and new innovative uh, advancements in medicine and engineering. And that's precisely what I'm doing. Because I had a goal, um, uh, determination set out that I'm going to do this and that's what I did. But not only is just you have like an empty purposeless goal that I'm going to do this and then you don't act on it. You have to have a goal in mind and take all the steps necessary to execute it. So Absolutely. determination yeah. is the first thing. So speaking of that though, the next determination me and Asad have, me and Ace have is making a million. <laughs> me, making millions. Yeah, making millions. Actually <laughs> a billion, but right, the first step to a billion is making millions. Right. All right, that's so why I'm, I'm getting this guy into the cryptocurrency game. I like it. Right? I like I'm, it. I'm, we'll keep As you guys posted. posted yeah. Yeah, we'll keep you guys posted on that. All right, what's the second tip? The second tip is uh, another cliche, but it's something that I uh, was became more privy to, especially when I met this guy over here. Mm -hmm. One of the most influential, one of the most reliable and hardworking people I know. Thank Even you, though thank you. He, he might not always come off as the most hardworking person, but he <laughs> That's definitely the trick puts right in there. the That's the trick right exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> so the thing is that it's not all, uh, always how much you know, but it's also who you know too. So if you basically paint yourself into the corner and you're doing all this studying, you're doing all this uh, hard work and you're doing this, but no one knows about it and you don't know anyone else to actually keep you in the loop about what's going on in the market, then you're mm -hmm. basically wasting your time you're just spinning a wheel right right, right. Yeah. so you got to know the people too you got to know the people you got to know your competition you, you got to know other in. people you have to be plugged in into the net you got to yeah. be plugged into the network all right, absolutely all right so that's a good tip last tip uh rinse and repeat rinse and repeat <laughs> rinse and repeat work hard and know the right people and work hard and know the right people and continue that cycle and when i mean work hard work hard and have a goal set in mind don't just be working aimlessly have a goal set in mind that I'm going to do X, X, X by this time and then set so out and do it. So basically put a deadline in your Put mind, a right? deadline. I so always put a deadline Yeah, I think somebody said a, a, dream, a goal is a dream with a, de de with a deadline. Exactly. And I right. So dream big and put, put a deadline to that. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so, all right. So uh, obviously you like to read, right? I love to read. What are your favorite books? Favorite books? I used to read a lot of science fiction back in the day, but now I'm like using uh, reading a lot of... Uh, non-fiction books too like uh, sometimes I do a lot of how-to guides but then I read a lot of these other influential books like Ian mentioned The 48 Laws of Power that's a very uh, favorite book of mine I, I think it's probably know. at the top of my list Robert Greene okay. is one of my favorite authors any other books you like any other books I would say I mean fiction or non-fiction fiction non-fiction I think I'm gonna get a lot of flack on this but a lot of uh, one book that was especially influential to me from a very early age was the Harry Potter books Really? A lot, of people, really? a lot wow. of people go like, oh, Harry Potter, that's just a fan. <laughs> but no, Harry Potter actually world, opened a world of possibilities to me because it actually spurred me to pursue a hobby of mine. So when I'm not studying and learning new stuff, I actually like to write a lot on my spare time. I'm actually working on a couple books. So actually, uh -huh. just reading the, the like, Harry like, Potter like, books. Uh, fiction books, like uh, creative writing? So, yeah, creative writing, realistic fiction is what realistic I like to write. Fiction, realistic yeah. fiction. And I actually got like an inspiration from the J.K. Rowling story and I saw how she basically created a billion dollar enterprise empire. and empire basically right. from just writing books and just from like seven books. I mean, so what exactly is realistic fiction? So realistic fiction is basically using your own experiences and crafting a story around it. So it doesn't have to be. So you use your experiences so, as a backdrop for your story. So kind of right? like a bi bio, right? Kind of uh, like a bio, uh, like if your experience. But it's somebody else's story. But it's someone else's story. It's like you take out like Assad and you put like Jake or someone. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Interesting, because that's actually what I've been thinking about, but not really as a book, more as a as a movie or, or a TV show, right? Because I've had, as you know, I've had lots of interesting experiences in life, right? Cool. And I felt I could kind of encapsulate them and, and produce them into a TV show nice. down the line, right? Cool. Very interesting. Yeah, we we'll definitely have to talk about that. Awesome. I love sitcoms. <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> All right, let me see. Uh, you like traveling a lot, right? I but love what, to travel. What places do you travel to? So I, when I was a lot younger, I used to travel a lot to India with my family because I, had a lot, I still have a lot of family there in India. But then recently I started to go more to the Caribbean. So one place I used to go a lot to and still go to mm -hmm. to some extent is the Dominican Republic. The Caribbean, which is a yeah. lesser known secret. A lot of people know it more for Punta Cana uh -huh. and some of the more touristy sites on the yeah. islands. It's on actually an interesting story. First time I went to DR, to Dominican Republic, I went with this guy, right? And he basically just 
called me up or was like, hey, do you want to go to Dominican Republic or whatever? I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> Where is that? I ended up going there and it's, it, it, the whole trip, trip was a blast. Right? All right, so I think that's kind of, this has been a very, very deep episode of hacking the system, right? We began talking about high school and how to make, how to become a straight A student, right? But it was a, a lot more than that, right? It definitely showed us how to kind of start out early, how to overcome high school, college, grad school, how to plot your career academically, right? And I think this is probably one of the best episodes because we have definitely have lots of college kids out there, even high school kids, right, who are constantly asking me questions about college. Yeah. And I think this video right here can become that de facto, uh, what's it called, cornerstone, <laughs> right? That, uh, res is it, right? Yeah. Cornerstone, right? That's well, a, anyway, that's a nice this it's been a very, very great time having you on the show. I appreciate it. You're I always, appreciate you, Ian. Yeah, always a pleasure. You're always my brother, brother for life, right? Yeah, brother from another And I'll probably mother. have you back on sometime <laughs> down the road, right? Yeah, anytime you guys have any questions, if you want any more tips to mastering college, mastering the university, and getting into the career of your dreams. Yeah, smartest guy I know. Let me know. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks. Peace. Peace. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks for checking out the show. Make sure to give it a like, subscribe, drop a comment and review. Check out my website where I drop game every single week. Check me out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. Let's go out there, make this money. Hustle to greatness.